Hey, Mike. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Right on. Yeah, welcome. Hang in with the friends. I promise Indeed. it's not it's not just you and me. Uh, we got a couple of... Oh, hey, look at that. I dress for the occasion. That is fantastic. <laughs> um, man, I think that's the, the first time uh, someone's been rocking one of our... One of our new shirts on the show here. Nice. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's no. going on? Really? Hey, what's going on? How you doing? I'm good. I, t I just, just tell Mike I dress for the occasion. Oh, awesome, man. Cool, cool. I was wondering if you got that, the, um, the document where we're, uh, we're shared on or whatever isn't updated. So I was like, man, I hope you got a shirt, you know? Oh, uh, right on. Yeah, I got it. Cool, cool. Right on. Cool. I believe we are live. Oh, we are. Um, yeah, we are live. Yeah. Good. Fantastic. You never, you're never 100 percent sure with uh, with, with Facebook, some of this, right? <laughs> this new technology, yeah, that the world's so steadily taken over. Uh, Mark, how you been, man? man it's I'm been great. Uh, God, almost a year since I, I think we first met you. Um, it was, it was, it was a year. It was like um, at the the Santa Cruz. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. One of one of the band's uh, most favorite shows that show <laughs> um but yeah dude uh you know for anybody that's just joining us this is obviously hanging with the friends uh we're here every thursday night 8 30 to 9 30 we got a uh, a music guest on every show whether that's uh, someone from a band or you know a music owner or in this case an entertainment lawyer if i have that correct <laughs> That's right. Um, which I think is probably one of the coolest, most interesting jobs ever. And I, I you know, I, I'm sure you're full of stories and I'm sure you, you can't, you can't share quite a few of them, but um, man, I, I mean, uh, right off the bat, I mean, I, I got to ask you, I mean, like, how do you enjoy that kind of work? I love it. I absolutely yeah. love my job. It's the, it's the best. You know, before I became a lawyer, I spent 10 years uh, working as a, a television sports journalist. So oh, I was wow. on like the nightly news, like the sports anchor uh, and reporter at a bunch of stations all along the West Coast. I spent about 10 years doing that. Oh and, my God. Uh, it was a really fun job. Every day is kind of a fun challenge with that job. Um, uh, but I wanted to try something different for a number of different reasons. And um, so I found my way into into law and specifically working with creatives. And um, yeah, I love it. I love it as much if not more on a day-to-day -day than I did when I was working, you know, in television and being on TV every night and all that. Uh, this is, this is at least as rewarding, if not more so. Um, but, uh, but also just like taps into so many different things um, that I like uh, one of which being the law and, you know, those type of things, but I like contracts and drafting and, and I like being around creative people and helping and feeling like I'm actually able to do something that maybe they can't do themselves or is something that takes up too much time for creatives, right? Because focused, you're focused on, uh, uh, on actually performing and, and making music or making movies. And so uh, I like to feel that I can like do something to actually help facilitate that. Um, and uh, so it's a super rewarding area of the law. Yeah. Wow. That's I, awesome. I mean, you make a good point with that because, you know, being on the creative end of things, I'm not great when it comes to drafting up contracts and everything else. So that's, sure. it's super that there's people that have the passion like you do to help out creatives. It's awesome. Yeah. Kudos. Well, and I think yeah. especially, especially in this day and age where, um, you know, creatives are, I mean, there's a ton of people, bands included, that are just expected to now to put content out on pretty much a daily basis. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I, I would imagine it's so much easier for musicians to basically stumble into like, you know, stuff like lawsuits and, and copyright claims and that sort of thing without really even knowing, you know? Um, it happens often. Yeah. Especially with the, with the internet. Yeah. So, I mean, what is, uh, what would you say is like your most common um, occurrence when it comes to, um, you know, the, the people you work with, what they hit you up for? Um, so I don't know. It kind of comes in three buckets, right? One is being prepared, right? So people coming and saying, okay, I heard that I should do 
X, Y, or Z. I should have a band partnership agreement. I should set up my business as a, an entity, an LLC or corporation, or I'm going into the studio. I want to make sure I have the right agreements ready to go for the producer or, that I'm working with or the other musicians that I'm going to hire to come into the studio. So let's say there's like a third, that's people that are being proactive. Then there's people who are kind of the coming in at the last minute or after the fact saying, Hey, I did this, but I think we should probably have an agreement. Right. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, another third is so taking care of things either in the moment or shortly thereafter. And then the final third is, you know, unwinding things that have gone wrong. And that's uh, probably the area that's most challenging, but uh, you know, those, those type of matters come through too, where, you know, uh, people have been working together and, and for some reason that, you know, they're not going to work together anymore. And so you need to unwind that. Um, or uh, somebody was working with someone that they just can't work with anymore, or it was a wrong person, or there was a misunderstanding of who was going to own what and who was going to do whatever it is with the what. Uh, and so they have to unwind that and, and it's contentious. Uh, and so that's another third. Um, and so that's the area that sometimes becomes kind of funny, um, at least for me, I, you know, uh, it's not funny for the people that are involved. Funny for me because I scratch my head and, and say, um, if these things had been dealt with earlier in the process, we wouldn't be here because we would know, right? Because at, at its core, when we put together a contract in that first scenario beforehand, when everything is smooth and we're preparing for the future, that contract is intended to tell the story between parties accurately and without ambiguity. And that at its core is what a contract is supposed to do. Tell the actual story between the parties that are involved in the contract right. in a way that no one's going to say, well, I thought I was going to get this because the contract clearly says you were going to get this or you were going to do this. Um, and so that's usually where the, the conflicts come up when we get into this like third level where people are trying to unwind and it's acrimonious is where there was no clear meeting of the minds or understanding between the parties on what they were going to do and what they were going to receive for what they did. Um, and so uh, uh, I like to, to be able to, um, one, you know, counsel people uh, in the beginning to get them in, on the right track from step, step one. I also like to step in and say, hey, you guys have gone to this particular point. Let's get this in a position where we're going to be good. And then I also, you know, find it a great challenge to try to be in a position where I can help people when, you know, it's gone sour to try to maintain, uh, you know, uh, what we didn't see the other night with that uh, presidential debate, uh, I think a level of dignity between the parties <laughs> as they carry on. Right. So, right. Uh, so that's the, that's the big challenge, right. When it comes to, to those scenarios is, you know, I always look at, I say, Hey, at one point these people worked together and were friends or, or had a, a, a business relationship that was good. But oftentimes they were actually people that were friends. And like my, one of the things I keep in the back of my mind is do do everything I can to make it so that when this process is over, everyone is still at minimal cordial with each other, if not still actually friends. That that's kind of something yeah. I keep in the back of my mind with these um, with these type of scenarios. It happens right. most of the time, but not every time. Can't win them all, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I find it interesting. Um, I mean, especially with bands. Uh, well, let me back let me back up a little bit. Uh, so it, it's uh, frantic romantic specifically. I think has had a very interesting, interesting year, um, a, a, a uniquely interesting year, and and you've helped us through uh, quite a bit of that. So we we are very much thankful for that and, yeah. and appreciate it. Um, I just want to cool. say first and foremost off the bat, I mean, you know, since the moment we met you in Santa Cruz, like I, I felt like we we gained a friend and we also gained a you know a, a partner. Uh, a business partner and um right on i appreciate that thank you hey you're thank you i mean uh that's yeah, the I, truth yeah there's so there's the been truth. a handful of things you know there's been a handful of things that we've had to deal with more recently that uh you've you've really helped us through so thank you for that um and you know just uh, with bands specifically it's it's always interesting because i mean these are folks that are getting together to do something creative in our free time and I think it's a miracle when people don't argue about it and when, when people uh, do get along, you know, 
uh, for an extended amount of time. Um, and, you know, with, with bands specifically, I, I think, uh, do you, do you find, cause I know being an entertainment lawyer, I mean, you're, mm-hmm. you're covering everything from bands to, you know, um, Stand-up probably comics, like artists, right. animators, yep. uh, yep. TV personalities, possibly film personalities, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Writers. Um, yep. Do you find there's a, uh, a certain ratio? Is there a, uh, a more common kind of client that you have? Um, no, it kind of goes in fits and spurts. I'll have like a period. It's weird. If it's like, if musicians are, are on deck, it's like a bevy of musicians coming through. If I start working with a filmmaker, all of a sudden I'll get five film projects. They seem to come in bunches for no reason, just coincidentally. Um, so, uh, but yeah, uh, I would say if there's probably nothing that that in terms of the work that i'm doing that i like more than others but i certainly enjoy coming out to shows for with musicians right uh, in particular yeah uh so i i like that part of 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 the work and you know to to kind of dovetail on what you were saying in terms of you know the this area of law that of entertainment law, I get asked a lot, okay, what's different than the obvious, you know, working with creative people, sometimes celebrities and whatnot, uh, about entertainment law than other areas of law. And so, you know, I, I thought about this question a couple years ago, and, and really it comes down to the fact that if you hire uh, someone to get you through a, a divorce or child custody, my mm-hmm. brother-in-law is sitting out in the other room and he's a, a, a family law attorney uh, and running for judge in, 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 uh, in Reno. So oh, wow. Aaron. Sorry, we got to plug that. Um, That's awesome. and, uh, um, uh, but, but if you hire someone to get you through a divorce or child custody, you want to hire a really good lawyer. Uh, and then you want to have them do the job for you. And then you never want to see them again. If you hire <laughs> someone to, to settle a dispute between you and the neighbor over a fence, you want to hire a really good lawyer. You want them to get whatever needs to be done over that fence done. And then you never want to see that lawyer again, right? <laughs> totally different for me. My whole business is making and forming long-term relationships with clients so that one, I can effectively do my job, which I can do much better when I know the clients and I know what their, you know, at least their business, you know, what they're doing. Um, mm-hmm. But also because working with people that are creative, I'm working with their baby, right? Yeah. This is something that's very uh uh, important to them, <clears throat> to them. Sorry, smoke. And uh, uh, they're passionate about it. And so uh, if they don't trust me, then I can't do my job because right. if they don't trust me, they're not going to give me the complete picture of what they really want. And so uh, that is the biggest difference between entertainment law and this practice where I'm working directly with clients uh, and other areas of law where you work directly with clients is that here it's about forming a relationship and trust that's going to be long-term as opposed to a short-term thing, get me through this one legal issue and then, and then it's done. Um, and so, uh, so that is a very rewarding thing for me. I'm a Leo. So I like people to think I'm important. And so uh, being able to be in a position where, um, where I can get to know the clients that I'm working with on a personal level uh, is really uh, an important part of this job, which is why I like to go to shows or if people are recording, I'll come to the studio. And believe it or not, I learn a lot from that. That sometimes helps me later when I'm negotiating a contract or, oh, wow. or some other deal because of something that I learned about somebody while we were, you know, hanging out backstage or hanging out on set or, you know, hanging out um, uh, at a show or something like that or in the studio. So it's, to me, it's very important to do that. And I spend a lot of time doing that and I don't get paid for any of that, but I really like it and it's fun yeah. to, to go. So that part of the job, I, I consider, you know, business development, but I also consider it like part of my life and my lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. Um, I, I definitely like, it makes sense what you're saying. You know, one, one kind of lawyer sort of uh, works in, in, in specific kinds of incidences that occur. And then, and then what you're saying is for you, it's sort of like you want to build long-term relationships. So that way when people like myself and Ruben and, and the rest of the band, when we have our struggles, we um, you know, we would, we would trust you and we would come back to you with those concerns, which to our own credit, we, we definitely have. Yes. Um, yes. To and, your yes. credit. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, not to tangent real hard here, but uh, for anybody watching uh, and and curious about Ruben's new uh, scenery here, it's just it's because he just moved down to LA. I think what today or something. It did last night. Today officially, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you just there? Just moving in? I saw. I saw just, the just here. Updates. Yeah. Yeah. Just here. Finally here. Are you excited to be there? I mean, you're a Bay Area guy, right? I am born and raised. Uh, born and raised in San Jose. Yeah. Same. So you were born and raised like myself, Mike. You too. I was I was born and raised in the Bay Area, yeah. East Bay. Yeah, so we yeah. are all three born and raised to dislike Los Angeles immensely. I know, Not right, the right, right. The people right. are wonderful. <laughs> But no, no, no. The right, idea right. of LA when you're born in the Bay Area, you kind of are, are born not to. It's like you like inherit it. You inherit that, right? You inherit, like you that, inherit yeah. that, that oh. haterism. You just kind of inherit for yeah. some reason. I don't and know. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, to its okay, credit, I, I, can, I can see why. Um, I love LA, but, you know, I feel like you go to LA to try to whatever, pursue your, your passions or whatever. Sure, sure. And, you, and, you, and you live in the Bay Area because it's very. Um, you know, it, uh, relaxing and, and kind of, you know, a bit more open and, and uh, a bit less violent. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're very different. <laughs> I've, I've been advised by my lawyer that I have to say I love L.A. No, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, what's funny is, um, is for all the, the shade that, that, you know, Northern California throws on Southern California and vice versa, I actually enjoy myself. Uh, when I go to LA every time, I always have a good time down yeah. there. And a lot of it is the people I know. And yes, they're Dodger fans, which is disgusting. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but we'll go to the games and sometimes my Giants win in LA. And I haven't, you know, I, ha I have not personally uh, been involved in any type of, you know, nastiness. I know it goes on and it goes on, you know, when you go to the games up in Northern California, but everybody's really cool. They, they'll tease. Uh, but that's part of the fun of going to a visiting stadium and, and, and supporting your home mm -hmm. team. Um, but, uh, but no, but, but the people in LA are, are really cool. There's some fun things, a lot of fun things to do down yeah. there. Oh, you know, crazy. I have lots of clients that are in, you know, in LA. Um, but, but, um, uh, but I never, I've never had a bad time there or have it had anything, you know, negative. Um, it's just one of those, things that you're born that you know with that with that kind of understanding uh you know in this in the same way i went to to undergrad at arizona state and we hate tucson and i still hate tucson <laughs> and i have no idea why i hate tucson right, I just do. Right. you say tucson i'll or you mention the university of arizona i'll get violently uh you know get violent and i'll throw the computer across the room just in hearing that and i don't know what that is uh it's you know Somebody, somebody ingrained that in me. One of my parents or something did that. But I did it to, to, my, to the kids in my family. I'm teaching the nephews beat LA, you know, when they're two years old, so. It's like we're sleeper cells, you know what I mean? It's just ingrained. <laughs> we're programmed that way, you know? Right. That's what it is. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's so did you move candidate. down there? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask Ruben, if, if, did you move down there for a, a work uh, family, what was the reason for moving down there? And it did it have anything to do with, with, you know, Frantic Romantic and the connection to, you know, Mexico and Tijuana? It, it and all did. That? Yeah. It did. You know, I'll tell you, um, it took, I, I did a lot of like, uh, press and stuff like that last year when we were able to travel. And, um, some of those trips I did in one day, like I would take a, a bus or something and it'd be like a 10 hour, 11 hour trip there run around, do the press conference, get back on a bus and come straight back, you know, and it was, it was mm. brutal, you know, That's I mean, it's, it is what it is, you're grinding, you know, and, um, you know, the few times that I was smart, I would be in LA already, meet up with Mike, and we'd have a two hour drive, two and a half hour drive. Yeah. And it just, as the more business we were doing down in Mexico, I was like, it just makes sense. Um, yeah. My wife has family here. She was a, she's a natural uh, native Angelino. So, oh, um, wow we wanted to bring my daughter up here so she could be with her grandparents. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's cool. That's the cool. last missing piece to that was a job. And I, I ended up figuring that out. Um, that's what, what actually delayed me that in COVID delayed me up until now I would have been moving in a, uh, in June. Uh, I was originally going to do a transfer through my other job that I had and just keep doing what I was doing and, you know, just focus more on frantic and family. But um, COVID closed a lot of the accounts down here. So I had to look for right. something else. And, and it worked out, you know, now this all played out. That's fantastic. Yeah. And it's cool, man. I, I can't be more excited to have uh, 
to have Ruben down here. And actually, You've like been down there for like a year. How long have you been down there, Mike? Oh, six man. years, right? Six years now. Six years. I, okay. I think okay. I just, I, I either just or I am about to surpass the amount of time that I lived in San Jose, because oh, wow. uh, I, I lived in San Ramon. Okay. Okay. So I lived in San Bruno from age zero to age five. And then from five to like, I think, uh, uh, 21, I lived in San Ramon and then I moved to San Jose for college for, I, I think I was there for like maybe six years. And then now I've been in LA for, for, uh, I think I just surpassed like six years, which is nuts. Just flies by. Right? It's crazy. Cause we started a project together when you moved to LA and I just can't believe that this much time has gone by, you know? I know. Yeah. Uh, well, Mark, you probably don't know this story, but like, uh, I had just moved to LA and, and Joseph and Ruben were like, Hey, we're looking for a singer. You want to be in our band? And I said, well, I'm in LA, but like, I'm not finding any work. So I'll probably be back up in San Jose, like, you know, by the end of the month. Yeah. So screw it. Yeah. Let's start a band. And then, uh, I think a week before I, I absolutely would have to move back to San Jose some studio called me up and they're like, Oh, uh, can you start tomorrow? <laughs> I was like, Oh, uh, okay, let's do it. And then nice. And then the rest is history. Yeah. That's the way the world works though. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. Man. Yeah. It's crazy That's though, man. Funny. California has a, a really interesting dichotomy, I think. And I, I didn't really know anything about Southern California before moving down here. And I, I didn't realize just how big of a, um, I mean, it, it, you don't realize like, okay, most, well, not most of the population, but a huge chunk of the pot of the California population is down here in, in, uh, in LA and it's in LA, a right. completely different flavor of Californian that I just had no idea. I had no idea. It, Palm trees and beaches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting when you're down there cause there are so many people it's, uh, it's like, a different environment in that the way that the city itself and the surrounding suburbs are set up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's somewhat like, you know, where, where you grew up maybe in San Ramon or, or, you know, down there in the peninsula, um, somewhat like that, but then on a much larger scale, but yeah. there is no, and, and although it's starting to take a little bit more shape, but the downtown is not like San Francisco, <laughs> right? It's not uh, that type of a city. No, <laughs> no, it's not. It's no. not. No, it's not. It's very I, unique in that way, right? Yeah. Before COVID, I I worked in in downtown, um, and man, it is an interesting, definitely, definitely. I mean, San Francisco downtown is beautiful and like just so like it feels so modern and European and and you know and and there's so many different kind of interesting like. Um, things going on downtown i love but it's because it's like super dangerous and like sketchy and like uh, <laughs> yes. downtown la i mean yeah yeah, um, yeah you feel like yeah. you're in like gotham city or something and you're just like man this is uh <laughs> this is crazy <laughs> yeah. there's some interesting things i went let's see it's about a year ago um and where that the angel's flight which was you know now has become a, a thing again because it was mm -hmm. featured in that perry mason tv show uh, right across the street from that, if you're familiar, there's like a, oh, yeah. like that food area. And then like the Disney theater is up at the top, that area there. And we went through some of the, the, that, the art district and through that center. And I don't remember what the name of it is. So I'm really sorry. Sorry. It's the for Grand Central, Grand, Grand Central Market. Yeah. Grand Central. Yes. And yeah. like really cool, really yeah. and very, and felt very European, you know, speaking on, on that front. Cause you see that in a lot of cities and also East coast, it reminded me of the market there in Boston. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's some stuff and we went and this, this really cool art installation, but it's stuff that you have to kind of know about. We had yeah. somebody that we were with and he's like, Oh, there's this new thing we got to go see. And, and so I was like, God, I can't even believe I'm in LA. Um, and yeah. but that, you know, you get that. And then if I, if I'm ever down there for an extended period of time and I want to feel a little taste of home, I always just go out to Venice beach, man. That reminds oh, me. Oh God. Of, I love yeah, Venice yeah. beach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Venice yeah. beach is great. And, and the office and I live in the hate Ashbury. So that the Venice beach is like the, the hate. Ashbury. Very much so. of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. There you go. 
Yeah. yeah for, you know, for me, that's one of the more accessible like beach areas. A lot of the other ones are, you know, parking's a nightmare and a lot of tourists. And I feel Venice Beach is like a nice mix of everything. Yeah. Right. Then, I mean, Santa Monica is, is really nice too. I uh, love Santa Monica, but, you know, tourists just crowd there, you know? crazy, yeah. 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 For, for yeah. my money, honestly, I, I like going to uh, Manhattan Beach. Um, if you guys have ever been there, it's, it's, I have it, man. I got to check that out. It's a little bit farther South and it's, it, people don't really think to go there, you know? Um, yeah, right. So it has some cool stuff. I mean, it has shops and it has the pier and everything, but, um, you know, parking is free and readily available and that's cool you know, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, LA is a trip, man. It's, uh, just, uh, it's, it's just such beautiful chaos and, and, um, people are, are either into it or they're not, but yeah indeed yeah indeed uh yeah and i you know it it pains me i was supposed to to go down to to la the week after the covid and oh wow so, see some shows and i was taking my nephews to disneyland and i was going to meet some clients i just had like a whole week of really random things that i was going to be doing down there and um and that got scrapped and so uh uh, that and then the week after I was supposed to come back from LA, uh, I was supposed to be out in Nashville, and then I was supposed oh. to spend the whole this whole month of September or the last month of September in Nashville, and that got that both of those got canceled. Ah. And that's another great place, you know, to go uh, for w with the music, music. And the music industry. Yeah. Nashville's fantastic. Uh, love being out there, um, and uh, and the people out there. Um, you know, certainly it's, it's different than, I mean, it's the South, it's different than LA. It's, yeah. it's a totally different vibe, uh, but equally interesting and equal, equally fun to spend time there as, yeah. as it is to, to spend time in LA, just because it's so um, energized with the spirit of entertainment and music in particular. That's interesting that you say that, you know, and, and um, what, one thing I really love about music is I, I feel like these different scenes pop up um, at different times. And I mean, obviously one of the most famous and probably the most that Ruben and, and Zeke and myself often reference is, of course, Seattle, right? Sure. But, um, you know, you, you do hear about these these cities popping up with these really cool music scenes. I heard, I, I recently I heard like Omaha. Uh, apparently Omaha is building a pretty big Omaha. scene. Okay. Okay. It's interesting because I always quote that, right? I always say, well, <laughs> you know, if a promoter's telling us to go play like Nebraska on a Tuesday, I don't know, you know, I always say that. I always like, quote <laughs> Omaha. You now know? you might take it. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> but I, I am curious to hear more about Nashville because I, I've never been there and obviously it has a, a legacy. Right. Um, have, do you, have you actually worked with clients out like in Nashville? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. In fact, I have some clients uh, they are, they're fantastic people as well as musicians. And <clears throat> they not only make me very happy listening to their music, but they make me laugh all the time with the way that they, uh, they interact with their fans and, and just the community in large, but they actually started in the Bay area. They're called front country. Hmm. Um, and they started as kind of a, a bluegrass and they've kind of mor morphed into something that's still got bluegrass elements to it, but it's way different. I think, uh, the best way to describe it, and I don't even know if they use, still use this term to describe themselves as roots pop. Oh, wow. Uh, but they're very cool. But they relocated from the Bay Area to Nashville a, a while ago. Um, and, front country. Uh, That's yeah, and I've been out the front country, exactly. Cool. And I've been out there to, and I've seen them a few times. And um, uh, and then I have some other clients that I've worked with that, that are in the Nashville area. And it's just a really nice, yeah, okay, here's here's the first time I went to Nashville. I was doing this really cool trip. I, I had some clients that were there that I wanted to visit. We, uh, uh, four of us, my wife and, and two of our friends, we flew out to, um, uh, to New Orleans and we went to Jazz Fest and it was nice. fantastic. I saw that, the David Byrne, what he's now, oh. when he took to Broadway and now it's, that, now it's gonna be on HBO. Um, he, was do, he was doing that on stage and he did that at Jazz Fest and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Came oh, out with man. a brain in his hand and all that. Awesome, fantastic <laughs> stuff. Uh, so went to Jazz Fest, uh, hung out in New Orleans for a couple of days, got in a car and then we drove uh, from New Orleans um, up through Mississippi uh, into, uh, into me Memphis, uh, stayed in Memphis for a couple of days, stayed literally right across the street from Lorraine Hotel 
which was where, you know, Dr. King was shot and is now the National Civil Rights Museum. Wow. Stuck, it, they like time capsuled the hotel, same cars in the parking lot and everything. Oh, wow. And we're right across the streets. So that was really moving and, and being right there and, and like literally staying in an Airbnb that was right there at the, and was there at the time. Really cool. Memphis was fantastic. Uh, from there, we drove to, um, uh, and we went to, to uh, Graceland. I mean, that was huge for you me. I love Elvis, man. To, right? And Graceland yeah. was yeah. so cool. Elvis, uh, And course, just the whole right? complex, man. Yeah. I got a velvet Elvis hanging in my house. Oh, nice. uh, and so I love that. Yeah. He, yeah. He's a big, and went to Sun Studios and took the tour there. Um, and then, um, uh, then we drove uh, to Nashville by way of Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and went to the Muscle Shoals studio. And took a tour of that where Leonard Skinner made their albums and the Stones did some stuff there. Wow. And that was really cool. Super. I mean, Aretha Franklin did all her stuff and Wilson Pickett and all that stuff came out of uh, Muscle Shoal Sound. And so um, got to got to tour that facility and and then to Nashville. And I had never been to Nashville before. And we drove in and we had a place picked out for dinner. Long story. And when we got to the restaurant. You know, on the, when you go to a restaurant, because they have the glass door and you'll see like the American Express and the Visa sticker on the, on the glass door used mm -hmm. to have yeah. the diners club. They had one that said, ASCAP, we pay our performance royalties here. BMI, oh, wow. we play our performance royalties here. And I knew right away, oh, I'm going to like this place. I'm going to like this town. <laughs> and like that's, that town is so music centric. Uh, and so geared towards that industry and they get it. It's very easy to navigate there. Uh, people kind of have an innate understanding of the rudimentary basics of how the industry works, good and bad, uh, but they get it. And when you see the sticker in the window of a just, just a regular restaurant, right? Yeah, they got a stage and stuff saying, we pay our performance royalties. I was like, all right, this is cool. I took a picture with cool. it and the other three people I was traveling with, they're like, why are you so cool? you know, geeked out over that. And I'm like, copyright royalties, they're paying. I'm like, you would never yeah. see this back home. No, anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. technically you could take your set, right. And you should get something from that, from like a set list or something like that. But most people don't even talk about that as far right. as venues, you know? Right. right. And so many venues don't even recognize, sorry, I'm, I just realized I'm drifting off the screen. No, I, um, no, no, you're uh, good. You're good. I'm in the yeah. cantina, by the way. I thought that, yeah, I don't know. I'm in the cantina from Star Wars. Right, right. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I, you know, so, so many venues around the country don't recognize that they have an obligation to pay performance royalties right. and secure blanket licenses. And it's just not something that they think about or that even crosses their mind. So to go to a place where it's just, it's not even a club, it's just a restaurant, a big restaurant with a, with a, with a stage and, and, uh, and they're recognizing that they have this obligation. It was like, oh, this is really cool. And a breath of fresh and, air, yeah. Yeah, and Nashville, much, much like New Orleans, and, and that's another, one of the reasons I, I love being you know, down in New Orleans is that you can go into a restaurant uh, in New Orleans, and same thing in Nashville, that has one table, and it's gonna have a piano with a guy playing as well. Oh, yeah. I and mean, there's music awesome. everywhere. This is the way it is. That's cool, man. I, yeah. That, yeah. God, I, I need to experience that. Um, yeah, there's there's I so guess. many places there's so many places in the U.S. that I haven't been to that I've, and it's funny. I, I always say, you know, after after work frees up a bit, that I would just take like a train and just stop in all these different places. Uh, but now with COVID, it's sort of like, who knows when that's going to be right? Um, right. <laughs> right. But yeah, it's, you know, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, uh, a town that actually recognizes having to pay royalties and stuff for, for music, because I think the most we kind of run into here in California is a venue saying, hey, don't record anything because we, we yeah. don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> no covers. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, co yeah, right, right. Right. no, no yeah. covers. Yeah. No covers. No covers. <laughs> Here, sign this that, that you agree that you won't get any performance royalties and promise not to do any covers. Covers. Like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. And that, you know, that's what it's come to, especially with smaller um, festivals because the, you know, the blanket license takes some, it, it's not that it's super expensive. I think most festivals could cover the cost of a three day blanket license from the, three major PROs, right? But it's the, 
the time and the, um, the, the getting up to speed on the industry understanding of what they have to do, what they have to fill out, who they have to contact. I think that's the part that many smaller venue or, you know, festivals specifically um, try to try to get around by saying, Oh, we don't want to deal with it. So no covers and sign a contract that says we don't pay performance royalties more so than them not having the money or not wanting to pay the money. Cause it's really not that, you know, that expensive to get those licenses. If you're a small festival, I think it's more just the person running it or the people running it, not wanting to take on that responsibility, uh, which is sad. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, That's yeah. the sad part. Right. It would be one thing if they're like, look guys, we really can't afford this. So we're going to try to skirt around it. But it's another thing when you find out that like, Oh, that blanket license for the weekend was going to be $1,500 and that was going to cover all the music from all the artists and you didn't want to pay that. That seems weird. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. Especially because so many of the artists that get signed on to play festivals, especially the earlier slots, they might not even be getting anything at all. They might be getting a meal ticket. Right. You know? And then you're going to say, Oh, you're not going to get your, you know, $50 for your performance license fees for that day. I mean, that's, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind it's of crummy, crummy, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's crummy. It's crummy. And then to find out it's not a money thing. They had the money and, and it's not a greed thing. It's just a, a laziness thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. They yeah. don't want to take the yeah. time. It's like, you, all you have to do is fill this thing out, you know, like, right. nah, you know, well, or they could find it, you know, some dummy like me to, to do it for them and it would cost them a couple hundred bucks. And yeah. So, right. Yeah, that, that's not that the dummy part, can but be I mean, frustrating. You know, filling it out. Yeah. Yeah. But when you see that happen, okay, you can rest assured that that festival probably won't be around for a long time. Uh, right. Because yeah. they're not doing, the, the, if they're going to cut corners there because they don't want to get up to speed or they're lazy on the business side, where else are they going to be lazy and how's that going to come into play? Right. right. So, yeah. yeah. And the big one there for me that I would be scared of, you know, that I, every time somebody comes in like, yeah, I'm going to, I want to run a, a two day festival or something. I say, okay, have you talked to an insurance agent? <laughs> because you need to get covered for, you know, for, for this, something right. might happen. And if the, you know, you don't want to rely on the venues got insurance, you want to make sure you're covered uh, because you don't want to get involved in a situation where you get sued. Um, and you don't have insurance and somebody as something as simple as somebody you know, slips and falls and breaks their leg, something like that could put you if you're, you know, not operating correctly in a real bad position financially. Um, when if you just got an insurance policy, that person would have gotten their leg fixed and you would have been none the wiser as to the cost and it would have all been, uh, you know, taken care of appropriately. Um, so that's the first thing I tell people is you have insurance. You don't? Okay, let me give you some referrals to some people that deal in this type yeah. of short-term event insurance stuff. Yeah. Not to get too deep on. No, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting because I think that is something that gets overlooked quite a bit, you know, and um, um, just, just to give you an idea, I mean, for, for a living, I, I'm a production manager at an animation studio. <laughs> so we have to deal with a lot of that kind of stuff too, where it's like, well, okay, so if we have a season going from October to October, or like if we have a, if we have a season going from whatever, uh, September to July, um, you know, we get, we got to make sure that we have an insurance policy for that much time, if not longer, right. If we go into overages and we have to extend people out, then we got to make sure that we're thinking about that when we're setting up the insurance for the, you know, the people working on the, on the show. Um, so it is really interesting how, how that all works. Um, uh, darn, I, I, oh, sorry, real quick about the covers, you know, that, yep. it's a bummer because, you know, I think especially at, at festivals, I think a, a band's biggest opportunity to get people to notice them, especially if they're like on a, whatever, the, the third or fourth stage, right, is, yep. I mean, covers are designed to be something that people will recognize so that they'll come yeah. over and watch a band. So it is a bummer that sort of, you know, there, there is sort of this, um, there is sort of this backlash towards, uh, you know, trying to get bands not to play covers. Well, and, and look, it's not every festival, right? I mean, lots of, lots of festivals, it's not an issue. Uh, they've got their licenses and it's just not an issue or they just don't acknowledge it. And at the end of the day, if someone's going to get in trouble on the PRO issue, 
uh, you know, the performance royalty issue. Uh, mm. It's going to be the venue or the festival, the promoter of the festival, not the band. So oftentimes if you're a band and you got to bug up your butt and, you know, your cover, you guys have a really popular cover that you do, you know, and you're like, that's one of our songs that people are expecting us to hear and you just do it anyhow. What's the, f what are they going to do? <laughs> right. What are they going to do? So uh, other than, you know, not invite you back, but if they're the type of festival that's not, pl that's not doing it on the above board anyhow, right. you then you don't they're not going to be back. around forever. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, then, then it's like, okay, we're going to do our cover. And sometimes they don't even know they don't have any, any rep there, <laughs> you know, tracking. Right. It. So right. Like, you have to take, uh, sometimes you have to take the look as a lawyer. If you ask me, I'm always going to tell you to do the safest thing and what's, what's in the contract, blah, blah, blah. But there's the other side of the coin. And that is that, uh, you know, in life and in business and in music, you have to take risks and the risks you take can be very rewarding and they can sometimes be damaging. But as with anything else, if you don't take any risks, if you don't risk failure, if you don't risk making a mistake, you're never going to grow and you're never going to get where you want. You know, the whole thing is about taking risks. So even though you may hire someone like me to say, don't take that risk, uh, then the, it's still ultimately up to you to take the information that you're getting from your advisors and the information that you all have from your life experiences and then make the appropriate decision for you. And it's mm -hmm. great that you have someone on your team that's going to say no. And it's also great if you have someone on your team that's going to say yes and present you the reasons. And then you as a, as a collective, as a group, as a band, make the best decision for the band. Um, and I think that that's an important part of it too. Well, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the, uh, what was it? The Ed Sullivan show. What, what was that show that like, the doors. Uh, the doors. Yeah, it was the Ed Sullivan show. Oh, the, the doors. doors. Right. Right. He didn't want him to say uh, the word high. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 Girl, yeah. We couldn't get much higher. He didn't want him to say higher and, uh, he did, he it, did anyhow. it anyways. Yeah. <laughs> right. And There's yeah. history. The entertainment industry is littered with instances of people who were told not to do something and then recognized, if I do this, I might get <laughs> in trouble or this person might be mad at me, but the publicity that I received from this is going to be far greater than anything I could ever pay for in terms of a PR right. maneuver. And so I'm going to do it for that reason alone, right? <laughs> and at the end of the day, what's the real harm, right? I mean... Yeah. So I love that. I love that stuff. And I, you know, one of the things that I did early on when, when we went into COVID and we were kind of all in a more lockdown state is uh, I went back and I took an online course on the history of popular music. Oh, cool. Yeah. And it was fascinating because it was, you know, you can see a lot of this type of stuff on, you know, the, the different music channels and, and even through PBS, but, but examining the history of popular music through, uh, and through an educational bent um, is really fascinating to see how it all kind of fits into the world within the, the context of history and, and, and everything uh, that, that is going on on the planet at the same time that the music's coming up um, mm -hmm. was really, you know, fascinating. But you see right away that the, the whole thing from, you know, from coming out of the era of, you know, country and Western and, you know, and, and rural R&B and then the voice popular music of, you know, Sinatra and Bing Crosby and where, how that became rock and roll and then took us, takes us to where we are now is filled with people who took chances. Right. And so, you know, you have to have that or else we don't, we're not where we're at now. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, it, it is interesting. Um, you know, there's, there is something very, um, inherently interesting i think about like like you said i mean timing when it comes to um these these different musicians kind of popping into existence and popping into our our um you know our our peripheral vision right and um like nirvana is a great example i i was reading this book this is probably about a year ago but it, it's sort of like with like nirvana i felt like it was a very specific band with a very specific song and a very specific time that if it was any other song, any other time, and, and even if the singer looked different or dressed different or whatever, it's like it wouldn't have hit nearly as hard. But for some reason, the, the, the stars aligned at that moment. 
yeah you know um or like Jimi hendrix like you know burning his guitar burning on his guitar. stage and stuff huh? you know and it, yeah. and and i feel like folks in that moment doing those things i mean they they have no idea that they're going to change the world yeah they, you know what i mean they're they're probably just having fun i mean like when pink floyd went in and and recorded dark side of the moon i'm i'm sure they were just like well i hope this does okay yeah you know? right <laughs> yeah yeah it's so true it's so fast and it's really interesting because you know, when I was younger, so my dad's best friend, Gary, took me to see my first real concert. Uh, it was December 2nd, 1989 at the Oakland Coliseum. It was Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jeff Beck. Oh, cool. And prior wow. to that, uh, I was listening to, you You may remember this, both of you guys, uh, I used to listen to uh, uh, KYUU, you know, like pop radio, right? Yeah. I walked out of that and I came home and I knew my dad liked rock and roll and I went right into his records and I pulled out the Led Zeppelin and the cream and the Credence uh. and the Santana. And I never went, that was, that was for me. And then, and then, uh, so I looked back on all those bands, the Pink Floyds as like, Oh, that was my dad's music. That's really cool. And I would ask him about what, what it was like. And, you know, he would tell me and his buddy, Gary, who's, who's one of my favorite people in the world. Cause he introduced me in, into loving music and introduced me to a lot of bands that I really liked. The Jay Giles band was one of my first favorites uh, and the album full house. And, and, um, and so, but, but none of this was my music, right? I made right. it mine, but it wasn't mine. But then all of a sudden I'm in high school and Nirvana hits. And like, I remember that, that whole thing, you know, as if it was, you know, yesterday and, and living through that. And now having, you know, younger kids look at it the way that I was looking at like my dad's music and me yeah. being able to say, oh no, I totally remember. I remember going to see, Alice in Chains opened for Van Halen and get booed off the stage. Oh my and then, God. <laughs> and then eight months later, they came back and they were getting, and they were number one album with, with, uh, with Dirt. Dirt, with Dirt yeah. right? Eight months later. Huge. I can't, I can't even imagine them getting booed off stage. That's crazy. Right? Hey, really quick. So my, this is my nephew, Gavin. And he's, he's right. a good, he hey. loves music. I took him to see his first concert a year ago, The Rolling Stones. Oh, oh man, wow. growing back, right? That so is great. Yeah. today's his 11th birthday. So I told him I was going to hey, bring hey, happy birthday. Hey, happy birthday. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. He got a he got a set of drums, so. Ah, oh, that's great. Wow. Yeah. You are so. let me tell you, drummers are always always in high demand. So you can right? have a lot always. you're going to have a lot of people hitting you up to to yeah. join their bands. Yeah. See? So you got to practice. Man, I think I got Legos for when I turned 11 or something like that. So <laughs> super lucky, man. Yeah, right on. <laughs> Right on. Cool. I got cool. I got Finding Nemo on DVD, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so let me ask you guys a question. Uh, so he's 11. He loves yeah. music. He loves 21 Pilots. Oh, cool. Imagine Dragons. Yeah. Who else? Who, who else are you into? Uh, I like Maroon 5. Maroon 5. Nice. Well, uh, back at yourself at 11. Uh, what, what advice might you have for yourself at that age uh, in terms of music career? Oh, I would say just keep playing. I started when I was 10. So when I was 11, I was a year into it. There was a lot of frustration and I, I wanted to learn everything. So me now telling myself at 11 years old, I'd say, just keep at it. Just keep at it. Don't let anybody just change your mind. Just keep doing what you love. Yeah. And I would say. It's very um, rewarding. And I, I would say uh, just soak up as much music as you can, you know, uh, even stuff that you think you might not enjoy. Uh, you never know. I mean, you could turn on something and it's just your new favorite album or you, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah, just, uh, I remember right around that age, um, and this is going to sort of date me, but, um, I'd always, I started going to the record store and buying two CDs at a time. Cause I figured, well, okay, out of the two, I'll probably like at least one of them. Um, so I, I, that's when I started going to the, to the record store and buying two CDs at a time. But I, I don't know if people do that anymore. So, uh, you know, maybe listen to two albums on Spotify. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Right on. All right. Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Thanks guys. Um, yeah, yeah, of yeah. Course. Awesome. No, that's what I, man, I lived at tower records. His mom worked at tower records. Oh. Um, and so she would get all the, like the, um, promos. 
and bring yeah, them home yeah. to me. And she's like, I got a hundred promos and I'd go through and maybe there'd be two or three that were really We're cool. Yeah, and so, awesome. yeah. But, I miss um, Tower, man. Yeah, I, I miss going <sighs> into too. a record store. That was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, the and Tower. Especially that era. Yeah. Yeah, the Tower yeah, that I went into, the guy that worked there would always be telling me about stuff that I didn't know about. You know, when I, when yes. I was collecting when I was buying Alice in Chains, he's like, Oh, have you heard of mad season? And I'm like, what, I, what mm -hmm. is that mad season? And he's like, Oh yeah. yeah. Do you check it out? Mad season lane Staley and you know, the Pearl jam folks. I was like, Oh, oh thank you. Tower records guy. Yeah. yeah. That's a great album too. That mad season yeah. album. I love that one. Yeah. 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 Very young. Um, I'm above. Yeah. That yeah. and like Temple of the Dog, I, I feel yep. are, are these weird, interesting grunge side project, um, yep. you know, oddities that hidden treasures. Right. I like the, the kind of the history there because you're right. You know, all those bands, Soundgarden had albums before, you know, um, uh, uh, Bad Motor Finger. And, you know, obviously everybody knows Nirvana had Bleach and Allison, Allison Chains was Mother Love Bone uh, or actually Pearl Jam, Mother the Love Bone, right? right. And that's yeah. the one that I like listening to is the Mother Love Bone stuff because you hear the clear yeah. change from hair band to grunge in Mother <laughs> Love Bone. It's right there. It's right there. Yeah. If you listen to their, you know, their, their music, it's got both things in it and you hear exactly what was going to happen with Pearl Jam, you know, unknowingly because of, you yeah. know, Andrew was untimely death, but you hear yeah. it right, come right from that man. And it's, it's a trip, it's a trip to listen to uh, the, the mother love bone album, the Apple album, or they did that, like that compilation of all of their stuff. You're the um, and, man. Uh, that's fantastic. You're the first person on here to talk about my mother love bone and and uh that just fills me with with so much joy uh that that's like um <laughs> there's some cool stuff on there man stargazer and uh stargazer yep uh what is that last Apple one is the with... other one I really like Chloe dancer crown of thorns that's when they the did one. The, and they uh. were two separate songs, but they pushed it together for the soundtrack to that movie singles right and then that's the right, way it's been right. packaged ever since and fantastic song. Yeah, and I think Pearl Jam, uh, at least for some time, Pearl Jam used to cover that one. Uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, uh, Chloe Dancer, Crown of Thorns. Um, it's crazy, though. Eddie Vedder and, and Andrew Wood have totally different styles and voices and everything. Totally. Yep. Um, yeah. Oh, man, Mother Love Bone. Uh, right? Yeah, it's fun to, to, like, to go back to that. But like, it has been very interesting you know, maybe Gavin's a little bit young, but, but, you know, uh, kids a little bit older than him are, have found Nirvana and Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. And, and like, I feel like a, this badge of honor because I remember going through that, you know, when it was happening. Yeah. 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 And so, and that was really, I'm, I'm one of the coolest shows I went to and now it seems weird, but like, it was a perfect mix. It was Blind Melon, Alice in Chains <laughs> and Ozzy Osbourne. That's cool. At the Cow That's Palace. <laughs> At the Cow <laughs> Palace. And like that show, I remember walking out of there and I was like, I don't even know what to think about what I just saw. That was crazy. <laughs> and, it was, and then Lane Staley had a broken leg and he was sitting in a, in a wheelchair the whole show and he was still going nuts. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, very interesting. The other perspective you get is, you know, I go to see, like I took Gavin to see the Rolling Stones, right? Love the Stones. That's just Saw the Stones awesome. for the first time in like 93 or something like that, right? So later in their career. And I've seen, you know, all the classic acts come through, you know, everything from Tony Bennett, you know, yeah. to, you know, Skinner and ZZ Top, but none of them in their prime. Yeah. And so we're, whereas kids today are going to see a version of, you know, Alice in Chains or a version of, uh, uh, Soundgarden or you know Pearl Jam, but they're a little older, right? Um, and they're not seeing the band when it was in its prime. I now have an appreciation for like when my dad and his generation talk about having seen you know uh, Santana at a small club when he was coming up or something like that. That it's just a different thing, and, yeah. Um, and I appreciate very much having been you know having had a really cool music scene that was coming through when I was younger. Uh, that I actually was able to go see. And that is a bummer, you know, with, with musical acts, I feel like um, 
you know, from the, from the onset of, of making it their career and touring and stuff, you're automatically fighting age and you're fighting sure. your, your, you're fighting your career, you know? Um, there's a lot of bands that I, I, I had seen later on, but I wish that I could have seen them when they were just like, you know, on fire, you know, right. Um, you, you hear about these like Jane's addiction back right around when they were blowing up and they would do these like warehouse shows in like the, the deepest, scariest parts of LA. And, and, uh, it's just like, man, how cool would that, would that have been if you were just right. in one of those warehouse shows where this band was kind of still underground and, and, um, and I mean, I saw them at, in, at Lollapalooza in 2003 and it was fun and it was great, but you yeah. know, it's just like, yeah, that grit, you I, know, I think for me the the, you know, in looking at that, like being able to say, Oh, I saw these guys early on. Um, there was a club that was on uh, Broadway in San Francisco called The Stone. And it's now one of the strip clubs, Centerfolds or something like that. But it was this cool rock club. I think that it went hand in hand with, um, there was a, a club down in uh, maybe Palo Alto that became The Edge nightclub. The Edge, before, right, right. So before, it was before The Edge, it was like a rock club. And I think bands would play that one, there was one, and then the, the other one in Oakland, and I want to say Catalyst, but that's not it. That's the one in Santa Cruz. But there was an Oakland club, a San Jose or Palo Alto club, and then the Stone in San Francisco. And the bands would come to, when they would come into town, they'd do all three over a weekend. Mm. Um, was uh, it like Thursday, a step Friday, beyond Saturday. or something like that? Palo yeah, Alto? one step beyond. Right, yes. that's what it was, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. And I don't remember the one in, in Oakland. But in Oakland, I, I don't remember one that night, one. My friend said, hey, come, come see this. And the headliner was, um, was Mud Honey. And then, wow. uh, and then the, uh, the support was Alice in Chains. And then the opener was this brand new band that just got formed, Pearl Jam. Wow. And Holy shit. So I'd never yeah. heard of any it's of like them. But Mud order. Honey was the, yeah, was, the, right. was the headliner that night. Um, and so that was really cool because like all of a sudden, like I said, a couple, I, I went out after that and I bought the facelift album from Alice in Chains because I love Man in a Box. Oh, it's great. So I bought that. And then I saw, hey, this band that we just saw, you know, standing two feet from them on this tiny stage is now going to open for Van Halen. And then that's the show that we went to. And I went, to, I liked Van Halen a lot. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and so I was excited to go and it was at the Shoreline, which is a terrible place to see a show, but still. Um, and then... <laughs> And then we go, sound, and then, yeah. right? The sound, yeah. And then, you know, Alice in Chains, I was super excited. And like, they got booed off the stage. And, you know, there's a really interesting article, if you get a minute, uh, uh, Google Sammy Hagar, Alice in Chains, where he talks about the fact that the, the Van Halen saw the writing on the wall, uh -huh. that, uh, that grunge was going to, was, was taken over. And so they brought Alice in Chains on tour to kind of watch it and see what oh. was happening. And that was the first show of the tour. And he talks about how they got booed. He said, by the time that tour ended, like they left the tour early because they had blown up. Wow. And, and so he, he saw it and he told the other guys, he said, we're done, man. We're, that's it for, 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 the, for what we're doing. That's this interesting because I know he's taken over. I know Jerry and Eddie became really good friends after that. Yeah. I was just watching a documentary on, on Jerry, how Eddie yep. just gave him a bunch of free shit. It was like, yep. <laughs> here's like two, two Eddie Van Halen guitars. Here's like a whole amp setup, And like, he just, he arrived home one day and it was all in his garage. It was just all yeah. there. You know, it's crazy. Fascinating stuff, right? You know, yeah, I was, yeah, was, I was just in really interesting stuff in the music industry, fun stuff. You know, you hear, you hear so much of the bad stuff. You bring a lawyer on, you think you're going to hear about all the bad stories, but there's a lot of cool, <laughs> fun, good stories. I was just telling a buddy of mine that, um, I mean, for most of my life, I kind of was not really into Van Halen at all. Like I, I just couldn't get into him. Um, but very recently, like maybe this year I started, taking an interest in, in Van Halen. And it's like, I finally, something clicked where I just finally got it. You know, um, it's kind of like how you hate Brussels sprouts, but then one day you're just like, Oh wait, no, Brussels sprouts are great. You know? Um, yeah. and it's like, I feel like I finally started to understand and appreciate Van Halen. Um, is it because you found Van Halen three and you're such a huge Gary Sharon fan? That yeah. <laughs> you know, for me guy. growing up, that's the guy oh, from ahead, ahead. uh what's the band extreme 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 yeah. yeah 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 you know for me growing up i had a buddy he was like my best friend 
And like, he always swore that I hated Eddie Van Halen. He would always say, that's like your rival, that's your nemesis. One of these days you're going to get good enough to battle him and, and leave him in the dust. And I was like, dude, it's not, it's not Eddie. It's, it's David Lee Roth I can't stand, you know? I'm like, I, I love Eddie, you know? That's I'm the thing. The person, uh, David Lee Roth, I can't stand him. You know? And like, same with me. I, I fucking hated David Lee Roth. Lee Roth. Um, I'm like, and the worst thing is like, he like knows Kung Fu. So like, I ain't going to mess with him. You know what I mean? I, uh, I had a, a, a night once where I, uh, where I met the uh, David Lee Roth's former personal bodyguard. And <laughs> we ended up getting drunk and he told me some stories, which I cannot repeat, unfortunately. Sure. That, like, <laughs> yeah, we understand. Are so shocking and so bizarre uh, about David Lee Roth. I always loved David Lee Roth. I thought he was fantastic. Um, uh, but, you know, he, especially if you cut his act later, I could uh -huh. definitely see how he is an acquired taste that if you were not in the moment with that. But I remember being a little kid and seeing like the... Um, the uh, hot for teacher video and being like, dude, I love that band. And like, you know, seeing it in the moment and like really being, you know, thinking that that was cool stuff. And so, right. yeah. So, so different, but now you look at, I mean, he's the cheesiest dude alive. Well, I mean, you just, I, well, you know, my first, my first uh, real, real like exposure to David Lee Roth was his solo stuff with like California girls. And, oh, like, sure. Yeah. And just, I was like, yeah, I was like, man, that guy, you know, like, I don't know, you know, and then I, you know, I, I got more into like the Van Halen stuff and I wanted to learn a lot of Eddie stuff, but it's just watching him just annoyed me. I was like, ah, oh, man, you know, <laughs> he's just like the perfect 80s front man, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, he like, is. He is. And, he and once is. that clicked, once it was just like, oh, wait, this is just like so 80s, um, just so gloriously 80s and like so debaucherous and like over the top and yeah. just, uh, it just, I don't know. It's suddenly, it's just like, oh, there is kind of like a weird science to what what this dude was was doing, you know? Was doing yeah. right, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned, of him. you mentioned Extreme. Extreme's one of the bands that I saw at that Stone nightclub. Oh, nice! Oh, wow! And, yeah. And uh, I had a good friend in high school, and he loved uh, their guitar player, Nuno Betancourt. Nuno Betancourt. I'm yeah. sure. I mean yeah. that yeah. that show. I walked out of that and. I, I was like, I, I don't think I, I can, I'll ever see anybody play guitar like that again. I mean, th wow. that was the most phenomenal guitar show I've ever seen. Nuno Betancourt is a, I mean, just mind-blowing, yeah. mind-blowing yeah. stuff he was doing on, on guitar. And to be in a really tiny place where you're right on the stage, where they're basically sweating on you. And, um, and see him doing that uh, was like, and then being there with someone who really idolized him, like that was one of the coolest shows that I saw there. I also saw Metallica play there. Oh, you know, wow. Yeah, yeah way awesome. back in the day. Um, and uh, uh, so that was a cool place. I, I, I wish that place was still around, but it was literally a, a, a black hole in the wall. I mean, they might, there might have been, a, there might have been a, a, a bar in there. I don't know. I wasn't drinking at the time, so I don't remember even if there was, there had to have been a bar, but they were in eight, it was 18 and older too. Oh, wow. Yeah. That. That's even better. So, that's cool. Yeah. So that was even yeah, better. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, man, I missed that. That was, that's one place I wish was still around. And I swear now it's just one of those, like uh, the, the center folds club or something like that over there on, uh, yeah, on San Broadway. Francisco. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I remember going to a bunch yeah. of shows at, uh, at the cactus club when I was underage, you know, and like, mm -hmm. those were cool too. Cause a lot of cool acts came. Alanis Morissette, Pearl Jam, yeah. Nirvana, like a lot of those bands before they were really big came and played there too, you know? Back in there days. was a club in San Jose. Maybe you'll remember the name of this because of its reputation. Uh, my former partner, Jeff, uh, with, the, with the law firm, um, uh, he was looking to actually form a partnership to buy this club. And it's, um, I don't even, it's downtown. It's near um, the, the Shark Tank. Um, and it was, wow. its claim to fame is that Prince did a secret show there one night. And just was showed it the Voodoo up. Lounge? Voodoo Lounge, maybe? That sounds maybe. super familiar. Because the Cactus is like the club front. everybody knows about. Oh, no, Cactus like, Club, I know that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah. was something I'd never been there before. But we, he brought me down to take a look at it. And we were looking in the green room. And the green room was bizarre because it literally had a shower stall that was wide open right in the middle of the green room. And the rumor <laughs> was that Prince had a whole thing go down 
using that shower oh, stall. I'm sure. And yeah. that is the specific <laughs> reason why he chose to do this like <laughs> impromptu secret show at this club at some point in the mid nineties. I think wow. it was the Voodoo Lounge. Voodoo, Voodoo Lounge, Lounge sounds I think sounds so. right. Yeah. We took a look at a club. Mike, remember that club we went to go look at? We were going to do our show in uh, TJ. And it had a similar. No, 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 no. no, In TJ, in TJ. In TJ, yeah. The black box. They had had a setup like that. The the green room was very shower-centric like that. Or it was like (laughs) see-through showers and stuff. Dude, (laughs) that place is like, I hope we get to play there, man. That place looks like it's just like party central. Totally. Uh, It's like three floors of like awesomeness, right? Yeah. Right on. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well fellas but it has I, history colorful history oh yep yep yeah it's it's that time again i'm the uh i'm i'm the time i, I think there time was a request cop. to say the time cop yeah so yeah the time cop yeah, yeah. i didn't the, even take uh, any questions what's that we didn't even take any questions we didn't even solicit questions oh yeah i know um do you want to check real quick before we go or yeah yeah a we question. usually we usually have a, a, a third band, band member on here to, to check. Yeah, where's uh, Zeke? He, He's on his way to LA right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let me see if there's anything here. Uh... Yeah, I spend the whole hour talking about myself. I don't even bother looking at the <laughs> questions. <you know? laughs> and I was just hanging out here. In the, I'm actually, I'm up in Lake Tahoe right now. Um, oh, awesome. For my for my nephew's birthday, birthday, and, right, right, and, and my sister, his mom's birthday is on uh, on Sunday, and so um, yeah, I came up here to, to to celebrate that. I should have thrown a picture of Tahoe behind me. Yeah, got the well, October. October is like a ton of birthdays for me. My wife and my daughter right. are a day apart. My mom's okay. just passed. My sister's is coming up. Everybody's birthday is in October for me. Trippy. It's weird yeah. how families go like that, right? Yeah. 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 You know, our family, it's the last week of September and the first two weeks of October or April. You just slammed. Yeah. April has a thousand birthdays. And then the last (laughs) couple of weeks of October or of September and the first two weeks of October, ton of birthdays. I'm the outlier being in August. August, right? Leo. Yep. Well, you know, I I hate to break it to you. We we had a shy audience tonight and and usually I I, I sort of need to goad, goad people into asking questions and i apologize um but uh i mean it's a good sign because we were just so engaged in our our conversations conversations so, yeah indeed, sort of lost indeed. track of time um <laughs> right on mark i think it just means that we're gonna have to have you back yeah i'll do whatever I think you so. want man yeah i love talking i got lots of stories Absolutely. yeah it's fun it's been a fun it's been a fun life for me and uh i'm just looking forward to seeing you guys play again me too um, i think that you guys had a show at What's the, the, our Blue Butaki, Lagoon? right? Our Boutique, yeah, our yeah, Boutique, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you guys had a show there and that I was getting ready to, to go see. And uh, God, so many have been wiped off, but there, we'll, we'll do shows again. We'll have fun. We will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And don't forget, the only, the only good part of working with me, honestly, is that when you release a record, the next show that I go to, I bring a bottle of Larev, which means the dream in, in French, because you're living the dream and it's a very nice bottle of champagne. So you got that oh, to man. look forward to. When oh, the awesome, comes yeah. Out. And I've got a, whole bo- I've got a whole bunch of chilling in, in my fridge because there's so many clients that had records that dropped and I hadn't seen a show yet. And so I'm like, okay, your, your bottle's there. We'll, we'll drink oh, it wow. soon. So, yeah. Awesome. So you have that to look forward to. And like I said, that's the only good thing about working with me. <laughs> That's not, man. Well, well you know, no. Awesome, I, dude, you, <laughs> oh, I, 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 I can't, I can't, um, you know, I can't uh, say this enough. I mean, you, you have been a tremendous help to us so far and, and we do appreciate you having on, we do appreciate having you on board with us and we consider you one of our, our close friends and, um, you know, we, we look forward to continue to work with you. So, right. yeah, I'm very humbled by that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. All, All right. right. Well, we'll do this again and absolutely. Sounds good to me. Yeah. And uh, right. cool. thank you to our audience, as always, for tuning in to Hanging with the Friends, where we have a music guest on every week, every Thursday, 8.30 to 9.30. And uh, we will see you next week, same time, same place. All right, guys. All right. Talk to you soon. See you guys. All right. Later. All right.